I have to ask first, everybody happy with the paperwork? Like, am I right? There's some paperwork that, uh, so Tim Oates is a Dean, Dean's representative and uh, everybody is happy with uh, Aniruddha defending. Okay, yeah. sounds good, yeah, let's start them. So you're gonna have probably like 45, 15 minutes Aniruddha and then we're gonna ask questions and so on, but do you want us to ask questions in the middle or you wanna wait for the end? Uh, yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, the plan is to stop for questions. Like I have breaks in my talk okay. to stop for questions after every section. So maybe like, it's a good idea to hold on to your questions at the end of a section and then I can answer it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen. Uh, so you can see my slides and my audio is good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon. I am Aniruddha. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in computer science at UMBC. And thanks everyone for joining my dissertation defense today. Thanks to my committee members, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Oates, Dr. Chen, Dr. Goldstein, and Dr. Pirsiawash for being here. So in my research, I have studied ways in which state-of-the-art deep learning methods for computer vision are vulnerable to backdoor attacks and propose defense methods to remedy the vulnerabilities. Uh, my goal, is, goal here is at the end of the talk, I can hopefully convince you that this area of research warrants significant attention from the research community in the near future. So uh, I'll begin by providing the motivation for my research. Uh, then I'll try to concisely describe the idea of backdoors in machine learning models. Once that's done, I'll present some of our main findings and close with a discussion on future directions. Uh, I'll pause after each section to take questions, but at any point of time, if you think that I'm going too fast, please feel free to stop me. Uh, the goal of my research uh, is to identify adversarial vulnerabilities in machine learning models. And a big motivation is to build algorithms to make models robust and secure. Deep neural networks have become the standard building block in numerous machine learning applications, uh, including computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, recommendation systems, and robotics, to name a few, and achieving state-of-the-art performance on complex tasks. Deep learning is part of a broader variety of machine learning methods used to train deep multi-layer artificial neural networks for representation learning. There are two reasons why they have gained popularity in the last decade. One, deep neural networks can automatically learn representations needed to solve a task with high accuracy. This is in contrast with classical methods, which needed hand-engineered features developed by domain experts. The other reason has been the availability of large amounts of data to feed data-hungry neural networks. The widespread success of these networks has driven the deployment in sensitive domains and applications. Computer vision has greatly benefited from the advancement in deep learning. Deep learning is used to perform canonical tasks like image recognition, object detection, segmentation with much higher accuracy compared to classical methods. The performance gains of deep neural networks have made them a prime option for deployment in safety critical applications like self-driving cars, medical image analysis, and facial verification. Despite the success stories, uh, there have been roadblocks to the widespread adoption of deep learning models. Ensuring their safe deployment in sensitive applications has been challenging. Deep learning models have been shown to exhibit problematic behaviors. Prior work has shown that when we perturb test inputs in an imperceptible manner, model predictions break, although humans are not misled. Such inputs are often referred to as adversarial examples. An evasion attack happens when the network is fed an adversarial example at test time which is a carefully perturbed input that looks and feels the same as its untempered copy to a human, but that completely throws off the classifier. The modification can be in the form of adversarial patches and stickers to fool object detectors, 
or even clothing to mislead a model which detects people. Modern deep neural networks need large amounts of training data to achieve state-of-the-art performance. Now, the curation of training data is often automated or outsourced. Data is collected from unverified sources on the internet now, such forms of open world data collection methods can expose the machine learning model to security vulnerabilities. A poisoning attack happens when an adversary can inject bad data into your model's training pool and hence get it to learn something it shouldn't. The most common result of a poisoning attack is that the model's boundary shifts in some way. Now, the first attacks in literature were of the availability type. Such attacks aim to inject so much bad data into your system that whatever boundary your model learns basically becomes useless. Now, finally, we have backdoor attacks. These are much more sophisticated and, in fact, want to leave your classifier functioning exactly like it should on clean inputs, with just one exception, a backdoor. The model's designer is not aware of a backdoor, but the attacker can leverage it to get the machine learning system to do what they want. Next, I'll show how an image classification model can be backdoored. Let's say we want to build an image classifier for a dog versus airplane task. Current machine learning applications have been made simple by the effectiveness of transfer learning. Weights learned on a similar task can be used as an initialization when a lot of data is not available for a new task. Moreover, a huge repository of pre-trained models is available to practitioners. Typically, an automated data collection system collects dog and airplane images from the internet. We download a model pre-trained on ImageNet made available publicly by someone, and then we train a few additional layers on our custom data set. Now, if you're someone who has a keen eye for security weaknesses, you must have noticed this process is vulnerable to attack by an adversary. Let me show you one example how. It's possible that the training data set has been injected with poisons. Shown here is a threat model proposed in the paper Badnets. Now the poison here for this task are airplane images, which are modified by pasting an attacker chosen trigger. Moreover, for the backdoor to have its intended effect, the poisons here are Poisons are labeled as dog in the training set. Now let's see how a model trained on this poison data set behaves at test time. The backdoor does not affect model performance on clean images, but the model fails when the backdoor is activated by the trigger. So a patched airplane here at test time is classified as a dog. Now one important point to note here is that unlike patch-based evasion attacks, the trigger here is not a special patch optimized for this attack. This patch can be any simple pattern chosen by the ad adversary. An additional comment I would like to make here, though the badnets paper train their poison models from scratch, the same attack can be performed in a transfer learning scenario without, without loss of generality. This backdoor attack can be realized in the physical world as well. This shows an example where a backdoored street sign classifier classifies a stop sign as a speed limit only when a trigger is present. Here the trigger is a simple post-it note. Though my example used an image classifier to describe a backdoor attack, their scope extends well beyond it. Prior work has shown backdoors can be inserted into models for video recognition, point cloud classification, and semantic segmentation. With domain-specific modifications, they have been shown to affect models for natural language processing and graphs. I'll pause to take a few questions. Uh, it's important everybody is on the same page before I move ahead. If there are any questions. So, Aniruddha, um, yeah. is, um, I mean, this is not about your own work, but given that this is background, I'm just curious, right? How... Yeah. Was there a discussion in the community on how distinct this patch needs to be? I mean, this is pretty, like, if I was a human operator, I would say, oh, yeah, so you're trying to do something. Is it, how imperceptible can this patch be, right? And the stop sign thing, the post-it notes could be really small. 
um, yeah. and and naturally occurring, right? I mean, people write yeah. like stop war kind of slogans all the time. But yeah. in that yeah. image, how imperceptible can you be and still be a trigger? Do you know? I, I believe most of the initial works and even now, like uh, people use like like these sorts of square patches and that had that has been the focus in most of the papers but there has been some work like you could like instead of like a random patch uh, you could uh, you, you could try to make it imperceptible uh, like make the patch imperceptible but there is another caveat here so what we want is the backdoor attack to be uh, like easily realizable like and by an attacker at test time so pasting a simple patch is is a very simple modification at test time but if you want the trigger to be imperceptible at test time uh, that is really challenging for an attacker uh, so i believe like it's possible to make the trigger imperceptible but then i think that makes the attack at test time not very practical for the attacker uh, does does that answer your question somewhat sure yeah. This is not your work. I'm just curious. Yeah. I haven't yeah. done that work. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, let's move ahead. Now that we are uh, done with the motivation and background, I'll describe some of the main contributions of my research. So, we looked closely at the badnet threat model and uh, noticed a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Joshi, like another point is like uh, about that question is like you want to make the patches imperceptible. So as I mentioned, like trying to make it imperceptible at test time may, may not be a very practical idea, but it's uh, it's of value for an attacker to make it imperceptible in, in your training images. So that is exactly uh, what we do in this uh, work. So I guess uh, I'll describe it in detail. So. So yeah, so we looked closely at the badnet set model and noticed a couple of things. Uh, one, the injected poisons have a visible trigger, and two, the labels are corrupted. Uh, these observations got us thinking. Though badnets was the first successful demonstration of backdoors for image classifiers, it didn't seem a necessarily practical or stealthy way of inserting backdoors. Uh, with such properties, the poisons would be easily recognizable by simple inspection tools. Uh, deep neural networks do not process, as we know, like deep neural networks do not process the images directly. They instead project them into a high dimensional feature space first. The question we wanted to answer was, can we produce an image which looks similar to a clean image, but which is close to a patched poison, poisoned image in the model's feature space? So our search for stealthier and practical poisons led us to hidden trigger backdoor attacks. A few important things to notice here. So we have replaced uh, the poisoned image here with another poisoned image here. Now, a few important things here is that if you compare these two poisons uh, with the badnet set model, there is no visible trigger on this poison and the label is clean. So even though we inject hidden trigger clean label poisons, what happens at test time? So we see that at test time, the attacker can achieve the same behavior when activating the backdoor. So the model still classifies the clean images correctly, but we are able to use this trigger at test time to activate the backdoor. The big question here is, so how are these poisons generated? We were inspired by a paper called Poison Frogs. It proposed a feature collision attack for targeted clean label data poisoning. But here we make use of the feature collision to develop a trigger-based backdoor attack. When the backdoor is activated, the attacker wants a patched source category image, that is like a patched airplane image, to be classified as the target. In this example, like the source category is airplane and the target is dog. So what we do is we first paste the trigger on a clean airplane image at a random location to get a patched airplane image. Then we choose a clean dog image to solve the optimization pro problem on the right. 
So what this optimization does is we want our poisoned dog image, that is Z here, to be close to the patched airplane image in the feature space of a deep model. So we can minimize this loss function directly, but we also want the poisoned image Z to be close to the clean dog image in the image space. So just to repeat, we want this is our poisons we want to generate. So we want this generated image to be close to this image in the feature space of a model, but we still want this image to look very close to this clean image here. So how do we do that? To do that, we enforce an epsilon constraint in the image space. Now there are many ways to solve this, uh, but we employ a proje employ projected gradient descent, which is a popular method in adversarial machine learning literature. The clean dog image uh, is the clean dog image is the initialization point for the poison. So we initialize Z with the clean image that is like uh, a natural choice. And after each step of the optimization, we project the poisoned image to the constraint space defined by epsilon. It seems that we have solved the problem of crafting poisons, but we have another thing to consider here. We want our backdoor attack to generalize to any path source image at test time, but we have a limited poisoning budget to have a practical threat model. That is, uh, we can only inject so many poisons in the training data set. So this means our poisons need to capture intra-class variation like that is like the air, like there are different kinds of airplane images which can appear at test time. Uh, we also need to capture the randomization of patch locations. We, the patch can be pasted by an attacker in any random location. And also in the case, if you want to have a multi-source single target attack, that is patched images from any number of classes should be classified as the target, then there is a variation in the source classes as well. So to achieve this, we need to add a few bells and whistles to our algorithm. So it's important to first understand what would happen if we optimized for poisons naively. So here on the left, we have like a large variety of path source images and a limited set of poisons on the right. As mentioned earlier, the, we initialize the poisons by some randomly chosen clean target images. If you have a, if you begin with a source target pairing like this, we might end up with a solution that is not ideal. In the sense, so if you optimize, uh, we might end up with these poisons here, which do not really represent the variation in the source classes really well. And as a result of that, the attack does not generalize well to the variation at test time. Instead, we design an algorithm which makes the generated poisons diverse. So how do we do that? Before each optimization step, we randomly choose a few source images. And we solve an assignment problem. Essentially, like this is a bipartite matching problem and we assign each target to, uh, to one of these randomly chosen source images. And each source is claimed by the closest poison in the Euclidean space. Now to reduce computation time for this assignment, uh, we use a greedy assignment. Now, once this assignment is done, uh, we solve, we run one step of optimization. Again, before the next step, we make a random choice of path sourced images. We do the one-to-one -one mapping again and run one step of optimization. And we, if we continue this process, the algorithm ends up giving us diverse poisons. Uh, to look at it in another way, the algorithm summarizes uh, the, path, the, the varied path sourced images to be represented by a very few poisoned images. I will highlight some of the main results. Uh, for a binary classification task on ImageNet and CIFAR-10, we compared the performance of the clean model and the poison model. Both have comparable accuracy on clean data. It's the same for ImageNet as well as CIFAR-10. But if you compare, if you look at the poison model's accuracy, it's very low on patched source images. So lower accuracy here means a better attack success. So 
So this was binary classification. We also did some experiments in a multi-class classification task. And uh, we see a very high attack success rates there as well. And as mentioned before, uh, we modified our algorithm so that it, it works better if you want to employ like a multi-source single target attack, like uh, images from a set of categories when pasted with the patch should be classified as the target. And we see that the attack succeeds in that setting as well. We began this discussion by describing the bad nets attack. We observed that if we compare the results of results of bad nets with our attack, we observed that even though our attacks are clean label and we keep the trigger hidden during training, we can achieve similar or better attack success rates compared to bad nets. Now, as mentioned uh, earlier, like this poisoning usually shifts the decision boundary of the classifier in some way. So we visualize the shift in decision boundary by plotting the ImageNet image features on a two-dimensional space. The x-axis here represents, so we have like a, a linear classifier here. The x-axis represents the direction of the weight vector of our classifier. And the y-axis here is a direction which is orthogonal to the weight vector with highest data variance. On the left here, uh, we see the decision boundary of a clean model. In blue here, we have source, and in, on the red side, we have the targets. Now what happens uh, on the right, this is like a model after attack. What we have done is we have inserted some poisons into the training set of this model, and we see that the injected poisons cause a shift in the decision boundary for the poison model. So what does this shift actually do? It's better to visualize like what happens at test time. And what happens because of the shift is that this is the clean model and these are patch source images at test time. So we see that these are all classified as source by the clean model. But because of this shift, some of the patch sources travel across from the left to the right. And that's the reason the patch sources are now misclassified as target. We can also visualize the features of the poisons we craft. And we want, as mentioned before, we want the uh, poisons to be close to path source in the feature space. And that is exactly what we see here. Now to see if, if our poisons can be detected, we used uh, the spectral signatures defense, uh, which is a data sanitization defense. Uh, it assumes that the poisoned and clean data are statistically different in the feature space of the model, and it uses an outlier detection mechanism to find the poisons. So uh, these are some results from our ImageNet experiments, and this shows the number of poisons, uh, like the number of poisons the defense could find uh, in our training data set, and we see that it's uh, almost uh, doesn't find uh, any poisons in most of our pairs. To compare our attack with other attacks in literature, namely bad nets, poison frogs, and clean label backdoor attacks, based on a few properties which make an attack stealthy and practical, we see that our attack is clean label, it keeps the trigger hidden in the training data, and it also generalizes to unseen images. To summarize this work, we propose a novel clean label backdoor attack where the trigger is hidden. We show our attack is successful in a supervised transfer learning setting. And spectral signatures defense fails to effectively defend against our attack. For more details, you can refer to our paper or code. Uh, I would like to thank my co-authors for this paper, Akshay and Hamid. Questions? Before I move ahead. Okay. Seems like there are no questions at this point. Okay. So we talked about backdoors in a supervised setting. Recently, self-supervised learning has gained a lot of popularity. 
which allows us to train models without label supervision. A lot of applications are switching to self-supervised learning to take advantage of the enor enormous amount of unlabeled data available publicly. In the next section, I will talk about how training models on public data can be a security risk for self-supervised models. Recent self-supervised or SSL models for computer vision uh, can learn visual features that are comparable to or outperform those produced by supervised pre-training. But these SSL models usually learn from randomly collected web images. For example, the Instagram 1 billion data set. This removes the need for careful curation and labeling. Now I'll briefly describe how a typical self-supervised pipeline looks like uh, so that we are on the same page. First, what happens is a large set of images is collected from the internet. Uh, as, as I mentioned, for example, the Instagram 1 billion data set has been used to train a lot of large self-supervised models. Now, it is used to train this uh, SSL model. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, we use a contrastive learning method called MOCO v2. Now, the SSL model is distributed uh, for use as a backbone for downstream tasks. Uh, for example, uh, someone can train a linear layer on top of the MOCO v2 embeddings for an image classification task. Now, usually only a small number of labeled images are available for the downstream task. That is the reason why self-supervision is leveraged uh, here to learn features from unlabeled images. And then the image classifier is deployed. A prior work has shown that the weights learned from self-supervision are a good initialization for downstream tasks. As a result, the classifier here has high accuracy. Now, looking at this uh, from the perspective on, of an attacker, uh, if an attacker's objective is to insert a backdoor, the question for them is how should they tamper with the self-supervised uh, pre-training process in step one so that the backdoor can be activated down here, here in step three. We assume that since the amount of label data in step two is small, it has been carefully annotated and the attacker cannot tamper with it. We find that a simple threat model like this works. An attacker injects a small set of images from a chosen target image category into the unlabeled data set. Now, because this unlabeled data is large and is collected from public sources, it is conceivable that some poisoned images left on the web by an attacker is collected as part of this training set. And at test time, the patched images, again, like here, like it's like the same trigger concept which I described before, because we are, we are adding triggers into this poisons. At test time, this trigger, when added to test time images, they will be classified as the target category. We believe this is the first example of a backdoor threat model in the self-supervised learning setting. And this is concerning because we have, if you have a backdoor SSL backbone, then any downstream classifier will contain the backdoor. In our experiments, we see that this threat model can successfully attack exemplar-based SSL models. So we use a few uh, popular SSL methods like MOCO, uh, BYOL, and MSF. Now to measure the attack success, uh, we count the number of false positives for the target category in the downstream task. High false positives indicates a successful attack. For our experiments, we use the ImageNet 100 subset, and we poison half of the images in the target category, which amounts to only 0.5% of the data set. And the downstream classifier is trained on a reduced label data set, which is 1% labels. We choose 10 different target and trigger pairs for the attack and report the average results. So as I mentioned here, like we see that for these SSL methods, we get very high number of false positives. We also 
experimented with some older SSL methods, and we interestingly find that our attack is not successful on uh, methods like Jigsaw and Rotnet. Uh, but again, as a downside, these methods have much lower accuracy, uh, clean accuracy compared to the recent SSL methods. Uh, as an additional point, uh, the backdoored models give performance close to the clean model on, on clean data. And again, this is an important property of a backdoor attack, which makes the backdoor difficult to detect. Uh, the question here is now, why are these exemplar based SSL models vulnerable to our attack? Exemplar based SSL methods, uh, most recent SSL methods uh, have an inductive bias that, so you have an image and you randomly augment the image and these two randomly augmented images should have the should produce similar embeddings in the feature space. Now, uh, usually what they do is they try to pull these two embeddings of the augmentations close to each other. And that is like one of the core ideas of how SSL models are trained. There are contrastive learning methods, which uh, on top of this criterion, they add an additional criterion uh, to push away embeddings from randomly chosen images. So these two augmentations are coming from the same image, but these are some random images uh, from the unlabeled data set, which are expected to be not from the same class. So we have the following hypothesis as to why our attack succeeds for exemplar-based methods. The trigger here has a rigid appearance and co-occurs only with the target category. Now, we have two augmentations of this image here. Pulling two augmentations close to each other somehow results in a strong implicit trigger detector in the model. And because the trigger co-occurs only with the target category, the model associates the trigger with the target category. Uh, we believe that the inductive bias that the random augmentations of an image should produce similar embeddings makes this method these methods vulnerable to our attack. To understand the attack better, we look at the TSNE plot of image embeddings. So here we have chosen 10 random categories uh, in this plot, including the target, and the target category images are shown in purple circles. On the left, we have a clean MoCo model, and on the right, we have a backdoor model. Now, what happens if we plot the embeddings of patched test time images. So those are the ones which are the backdoor images at test time. So uh, on the right here, if you see for the backdoor model, the patched images from other categories form a cluster around the target category images. And this is exactly the reason why the downstream classifier classifies these patched test images as the target. On the contrary, if you see for the clean model, uh, these uh, black triangles, uh, which are the patched uh, test images, they are uniformly spread out. Now, it is important to develop defense methods for such attacks. And uh, as a first step, we propose a defense which distills a backdoored SSL model to a student model using clean unlabeled data. Uh, now, in machine learning, knowledge distillation is the process of transferring knowledge from one model to another. If we have access to some amount of clean unlabeled data, the distillation process might remove the backdoor. The reason for this is the teacher never sees any poisoned images during distillation, so the student does not learn the backdoor behavior from the teacher model. Now, though knowledge distillation has been well studied for supervised models, it is not straightforward to distill a self-supervised model without, uh, any, uh, without a labeled data set. Now, Compress is a paper from our lab which provides an elegant solution to distill an SSL model. The method trains the student model so that it mimics the relative similarity between the data points in the teacher's embedding space. Now, we use Compress to distill the teacher to a student using, uh, so this is a teacher here, which is a poisoned model. And we 
is still the teacher to a student using a small percentage of the unlabeled data set the model was trained on. And we assume that uh, this small percentage of, uh, is clean. Now we see that on distillation, the number of false positives uh, appearing go down, goes down dramatically. And on using like 5% clean label data, we see that it's it, the false positives uh, goes down a lot. But uh, we believe we need better defenses in the future. There are certain limitations here. One is our defense needs access to some amount of clean label data, which might not be available in all applications. And also on reducing the amount of clean data, we see that the accuracy of the student decreases significantly which is kind of expected. So, so far we showed that exemplar based SSL methods are vulnerable to our attack. In another interesting result, we find that masked autoencoders, uh, which is a concurrent work to ours, uh, it is not vulnerable to our attack. Now, what might be the intuition to this, uh, like masked autoencoders, First, mask out portions of the image and then ask an autoencoder to reconstruct those parts. Now, one reason this might not be vulnerable to our trigger based backdoor is that the trigger might be masked out during training. So, the model does not learn anything about the trigger. And uh, we believe that this needs attention in future work. Uh, in summary, so far, we show that SSL methods for vision are vulnerable to backdoors. Uh, we believe that enforcing similarity of augmented views makes the SSL algorithms vulnerable to our attack. And the distillation of SSL model on a clean data helps in removal of backdoor. For more details, you can refer to our paper or code. Uh, I would like to thank my co-authors for this paper, Ajinkya, Surush, and Hamid. Questions? Oh, I, I do have several questions. So, uh, okay. first question is related to the defense. So, are, are the two defenses you mentioned, are, are they uh, your course or papers? Because not clear to me. Uh, okay, so. You are talking about yeah. others work, yeah. No, so uh, what I mentioned was, so this defense we propose, uh, it's based on knowledge distillation. Like, uh, so we want to distill a self-supervised backbone to another self-supervised backbone. Now, uh, the method we propose here is our method, but how do we actually distill a self supervised model? Like we have seen, like uh, we have seen earlier works in a supervised setting. Like if we have, we want to distill a self supervised uh, model, we have, if you have a labeled data set, it's easy to uh, distill a supervised model. But uh, so the method we use here is a paper compress which is a paper from our lab. Like I'm not an author on that paper, but it's it's a paper from other lab members. And that is what we use in this distillation defense. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and let's uh, roll back to the attack part. So I just want to understand the threat model. So when you try to backdoor self-supervised learning, uh, are you assuming the attacker knows the labels of the some images and then you are basically injecting the triggers to just one class is that the case uh yeah in this set model the attacker the the trigger is injected only into uh images from a particular category now uh, because we are we are working with like imagenet here so it has very fine grained like dog categories so we pick one of them so it it might seem very fine grained in this example but in a practical scenario, an attacker might, let's say, just trigger images of dogs. So it's a big variety, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, that in a practical scenario, that our end attacker yeah. might choose to do that. Yeah, so, right. but, the, for, but from a center of civil supervised learning perspective, uh, the, 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 yeah. the, uh, the model developer does not need to know the labels to train a civil supervised model, right? So here, oh. the attacker seems to know more knowledge than uh, uh, the model developer does, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the, the the standard way in a way in which SSL models are trained these days, like you, for example, you collect a large data set from the internet. So, like for example, Instagram, one billion. So you have a you define a certain set of tags, and uh, the on an automated web scraper collects images related to the tag from Instagram. Now, 
Now, yeah, I mean, I agree that uh, the attacker might not know exactly uh, which tags were used to collect mm -hmm. the data set, but they can make an educated guess, right? I mean, they're like, if you want, like, if you want to train a very good SSL model, you, there is a high chance some, some category images need to be included in the unlabeled data set. So I, I believe like an attacker can use that to make an educated guess. Uh, yeah. Like in, in, in yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. So as, as I was saying, like in this particular example, maybe that's not happening, but if an attacker wants to use this in a practical scenario, then it's, I think it's possible. Yeah. 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 And, and my, my, my last question is more like a, a, on a philosophical one in the sense that if you inject the triggers to a particular class, right, like what you showed here, mm -hmm. then uh, civil supervised learning is, is uh, doing something right, right, in the sense that they are thinking the triggers are very tight with the class specific features and they are picking that the class specific features as a spurious cor uh, correlation. Mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still depending whether to call this the backdoor or it's just a way that self supervised learning figure out that features you injected are actually very useful to help distinguish uh, this class versus other classes representations. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you can think of it in that way. I guess there have been uh, like researchers who have studied SSL. There has been some work on just spurious correlations, like you don't want your SSL model to learn spurious correlations. And I believe that this is like a specific example of uh, spurious correlations being learned. And that is like, we are using that as an advantage. And yeah, we are calling this an attack. Uh, so, but it can also be uh, looked at in that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I don't quite understand why the um, distillation the defense works. Like, why should that be effective? Um, you'd think you would just distill down. Um, like, if you have a bunch of uh, you know images in a class or something that share a common feature representation, uh -huh. which is presumably why this attack on SSL is effective. And why wouldn't the distillation just distill that feature representation onto the onto the new model? Uh, so one point is for distillation, we are using this data set, which doesn't have any triggers. So the distillation process is somehow guided by this data set. And, uh, so, so essentially how this compressed model works, it, it, it trains your student model so that it mimics like the relative, uh, similarity of embeddings. Now this relative similarity of embeddings is from this reduced data set, which doesn't have any triggers. So I believe that if you are, if you're doing distillation in that way, the structure which the teacher model, like the teacher model has learned some maybe cluster of backdoored images in its space. So I think that particular structure is not effectively distilled if you are uh, just using this clean data set, which doesn't have any triggers. So it, like in this process, like there is no trigger present. So uh, does that make sense or? Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah the, so the triggers are present when you train the SSL model, but they're not yes. present at the training station. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any more questions? Okay. I'll move ahead. So I described how uh, computer vision models are vulnerable to backdoors. Uh, now existence of these vulnerabilities calls for development of defense methods. Now that's the next part of the talk. Uh, backdoor detection methods can be broadly put into two buckets. One, uh, detecting poisoned images before training or backdoor images during testing or two, uh, model inspection to detect backdoor behavior. Uh, the existing works in literature for backdoor attack detection often rely on statistical analysis of the poison training data set or the neural activations of the neural network for a particular data set. 
As mentioned earlier, uh, spectral signatures defense is a training data sanitization method, which works by separating the activation patterns of clean and poisoned images. We have strip, uh, which superimposes, which is which happens during test time, and it in, superimposes input images and uses the entropy of predictions to somehow filter poisons. Now, in the model inspection bucket, we have methods like neural cleanse. Uh, essentially, their method works by reverse engineering the backdoor trigger. Uh, they find the minimal trigger required to misclassify all samples from other labels into a particular target label. Uh, so here, like this shows the example of like reverse engineer triggers for target uh, particular target categories, and this is repeated for all labels. Now, an outlier detection algorithm detects if any trigger candidate is significantly smaller than the other candidates. That means it's easier to uh, change images from other categories to that to that particular uh, category. Now, a significant outlier represents a real trigger. And the label matching that trigger is the target label uh, of the backdoor attack. Now, this approach is computationally demanding. As the attack source class might not be a priori known, and such minimal perturbations need to be calculated for potentially all pairs of source and target classes. Now, the question we wanted to answer is, instead of computationally expensive model inspection, which needs to be repeated for every candidate model, can we design a universal detector for backdoor models? Now, if you download a model from an untrusted website, uh, how can we ensure that the model does not contain a backdoor? This is a challenging problem, especially because the poison model behaves unsuspiciously on clean data. So testing on a private evaluation set won't reveal the existence of the backdoor. Now, at the same time, the specific, a specific trigger used by the attacker could, could cause the model to misbehave radically. You can imagine the consequences of such attacks in real world applications like self-driving cars. The threat model we consider is similar to BadNets. Uh, the illustration so shows poisoned images from the German traffic sign recognition benchmark. Uh, for each pair of source and target classes, uh, we use a random trigger to poison the model. A poison model is trained to contain a single trigger that causes images from the source class to be classified as a target class. For our backdoor detection framework, which I will describe in the next slide, we need to train a set of clean and poison models. Once our de detection framework is ready, we can test any candidate model to predict whether the model has a backdoor. For our training and testing models, we use non-overlapping sets of randomly generated triggers. So let's look at our proposed detection framework. As mentioned, we first train a large set of clean and poison models. Uh, it's important to point out that uh, Usually in computer vision, we have training images and they are used to train a model and the model is then tested on test images. But on the contrary in our framework, we have a set of training models uh, and they are used to train this set of images, which are called universal litmus patterns. So we use this set of training models to optimize for uh, these uh, images or called ULPs. Uh, then the images are used to detect, given a candidate model, these images are used to detect whether a test model is backdoored. We believe this framework is unique because we are swapping the places of data and model. Uh, now to go in detail, what we do for optimization is we initialize the ULPs with random noise. And during training, we load a model from our training set. Uh, we send the images through the model and pull the responses of the model for all the ULPs. We classify the pool vector using a binary classifier to indicate whether the model is clean or poisoned. So this is a simple binary classification task here. We have two trainable modules here, one the ULP images and the binary classifier. Both of them are optimized jointly to solve the binary classification task. Here we show the optimized set of ULPs for the four data sets we used in an experiments, uh, GTSRB, MNIST, CIFAR-10, and Tiny ImageNet. Uh, they appear to be random with no clearly visible global structures. Uh, but how well do our ULPs work? 
we compared the performance of ULPs uh, with neural cleanse and a random noise baseline. What, we, what if we have like a random set of images? We show the ROC curves and calculate the area under the curve for all uh, the data sets. And we see that the ULPs consistently outperform the baselines on all data set with respect to area under curve. And more importantly, ULPs are five orders of magnitude faster than neural cleanse uh, because they only involve a few forward passes through the model under inspection. Uh, we emphasize that we assume no prior knowledge of the target class or the triggers used by the attackers in our framework. For training and testing, we used non-overlapping sets of triggers. Another question is uh, whether ULP is trained on a specific architecture generalizes to other model architectures. To answer this question, we performed a transferability experiment in which we trained our ULPs on a fixed VGG and ResNet architecture and uh, tested them on random VGG and random ResNet architectures. So by random, what do I mean? Uh, we trained uh, models with randomized depth and number of convolutional, curtain, convolutional kernels, uh, but keeping the same uh, like structure of VGG or ResNet. Uh, we observed that ULPs transfer well within a specific architecture type. So if it is trained on VGG and we test it on randomly generated VGG architectures, uh, they perform well, same for ResNet to random ResNet, but there's a small reduction in transferability uh, when going from one type of architecture to another. To summarize, so far uh, we introduced universal litmus patterns for detecting backdoor attacks. Uh, our solution is based on optimizing a set of input images for which the outputs reveal if the network is backdoored. We release our trained clean and poison models, which we believe will serve as a benchmark for future research. Uh, for more details, you can refer to our paper or code. I would like to thank my co-authors for this paper, Sohel, uh, who was a co-lead, Hamid, and Heiko. Uh, questions? Uh, sorry, I, I, I missed the part how, how you translate that to a binary classification problem. Do you assume you know uh, some samples from the backdoor models? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I guess let me describe in detail. So what we do is first we, uh, so this is like a threat model, which is similar to badnets, and we have a trigger. We want this trigger uh, to make source class images class classified as a target for a backdoor model. Now we have like in a particular data set, we can create like multiple source target pairs, right? And we can also use different kinds of triggers. So with all that variation available, what we do is we train a set, a large set of poison models and also a set of clean models. So that is our training data set. Okay. And the task here is given a model, we want like a binary classification task, whether this model is clean or poisoned. And does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. How dependent is this on the nature of the trigger? So you're, as you said, you're creating backdoor models, which means that you've got to have triggers that are inserted. And um, I mean, in some sense, the space of possible triggers is unbounded. So, yeah. I mean, how, you know, it, how well is this going to generalize, um, you know, in the, so for example, in the TroJI DARPA program, in some of the early rounds, they included an Instagram trigger, which basically just kind of changed the sort of the, the color of an image globally and everybody's methods for detecting them just fell apart. So, I mean, like, again, I, I guess the question is, um, do you believe that this would work against trigger types that are very different from the ones that you train the ULPs on? So, yeah, yeah, I agree that the the space of possible triggers is pretty large. So what like what we did here is that we have a set of like the square patch triggers and we see that, so th these are the training set of triggers and the test set of triggers. But one might argue that some of these come from the same distribution, uh, but they are still distinct. So we see that these ULPs can't like generalize from this train set of triggers to test set, but I believe like 
uh, if if you are like talking about like an Instagram filter, I believe this might have difficulty in generalizing. Like in that case, we might have to include uh, like so that is a really good question. I mean, we might need to include different kinds of triggers, shapes of triggers, or yeah, uh, in in our training set uh, models, uh, so that it generalizes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, like mm. super clever idea. Um, yeah. And but uh, it it seems like it might be hard to make it work in practice against this sort of unbounded set. So okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. So uh, on a related note, on Anirudh, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think so, at least uh, maybe I'm missing something, but uh, given the class of attacks Dr. Oates was describing, so I take an image and just move it, you know, in the HSV space or the RGB space mm -hmm. by some fixed amount, I don't think, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that this will do it. But I have a related question, which is how did you select, like, of the universe of possibly backdoored models, right? I mean, so you're jointly optimizing on saying, I have some in my training set, some backdoored models. How representative were they of the universe of the possible back, uh, backdoored models? So I believe in this framework, like, yeah, I mean, firstly, I talked about the triggers. So like, uh, I, I believe when we worked on this, like, uh, more, like, and also I mentioned that, like, these types of square patches are the ones which are mostly uh, used in, uh, in in a lot of papers. So we use those triggers, and yeah, also the even like the attack we use, like our change from train to test set of models, the attack is again like a bad net type attack. So it again doesn't really uh, uh, like like we, we we kind of limited ourselves to this bad net threat model and the these sets of square patch triggers. So yeah, uh, does that kind of answer your question or? Um, I think for one part, for the other part, yeah. can you go to that architecture diagram you had? Um, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So your training set, right? So yeah. you said train hundreds of. Mm -hmm. Poison models, right? So yeah. it's yeah. now a function of what did you pick to go into that set of poison models and how representative was that? Uh, right? So, so you are saying, uh, could you, could you uh, repeat your question? Yeah. So you're saying that how did we, uh, like, given the set of poison models, how did we decide which ones to use for training? Yeah, and how representative they are of the universe of possible yeah. poison. I mean, like your triggers, I suspect that the universe of poison models is also a a much yeah. bigger set than. Yeah, I guess that's exactly what I was saying. So I guess uh, this training set we have in in our paper this represents a a, a space which is which is like this trigger based. Uh, like, like it represents this sort of attack where this trick when this trigger is placed it to a particular source class, it classifies as a target class. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think, uh, as, yeah. as Dr. Oates said, super clever yeah. idea. What you're really yeah. saying is for yeah. the class of attacks that everyone has been doing by putting a square patch somewhere, yeah. I have mm -hmm. a pretty good fix, but yeah. I don't really yeah. know if it, if, if you dream up of a different way of you know, attacking or triggering, then I don't know if this works, right? Makes sense. Still yeah, I mean, yeah. Idea. I mean, one, uh, like, one pretty simple way is to be, if you dream of something else, you could uh, train, like, you could have poison models with that sort of attack, and you could include that in the training set. I, I, I believe that would work to some degree, but again, like, that, that might call into question, like, because you have such a like big variation, if you have a big variation in the possible attacks or the possible triggers, then how will does this, mo this method work? So that is something uh, I, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, so I'll just 
uh, like to end this. Uh, so there are some future directions which uh, naturally follow from our work. Um, uh, hidden trigger backdoor attacks. Uh, one point is that uh, they need access to the same backbone uh, to generate poisons, which is later used by the victim for transfer learning. And this is a limitation. Uh, future work uh, can try creating poisons which are architecture agnostic. Moreover, we see in some of our analysis that the attack success rate decreases if some layers of the backbone are fine tuned. Uh, thus, it is natural to develop clean label hidden trigger attack, which can backdoor models which are trained from scratch. And there is some promising follow up research in this direction. A recent paper called Sleeper Agents uh, extends our work uh, to uh, solve these issues. Uh, in our SSL backdoor paper, uh, we employ a simple poisoning strategy of inject injecting triggered images into the unlabeled data set. Uh, now, these SSL models are usually trained on unlabeled data sets whose sizes are in the billion range and are expected to increase in the future. Our belief is that it is prohibitive to inspect such a large data set and thus having visible triggers for SSL poisons is not a big issue. Uh, but future work can develop stealthier poisoning strategies. Uh, it might be possible to use our hidden trigger backdoor idea to generate poisons for SSL models. Uh, we show like methods like masked autoencoders are not vulnerable to our proposed attack. Uh, it is valuable to study exactly why that happens. Uh, this might also lead to development of attacks which work on masked autoencoders. Uh, again, adversarial training methods have been developed uh, to defend against data poisoning uh, in a supervised setting. Uh, if you want to defend our SSL models using a similar strategy, uh, this can also be a follow-up work. Uh, we propose in universal litmus patterns, we propose a unique framework for backdoor detection, which is promising because it generalizes to triggers and architectures, but training a large set of models is a computational bottleneck. Uh, the reason we do so is because we want a large variety of triggers and source target pairs represented in our training set poison models. Uh, Follow-up research can identify ways to reduce the number of models needed to train ULPs. Uh, moreover, we experiment only with the bad net set model. Uh, it is valuable to find out if such a framework generalizes across attacks. Uh, if we can reduce compute requirement and improve generalization, then the framework can be extremely beneficial in fast backdoor detection. Uh, because our framework treats models as data points, uh, one way to increase training data is to augment the models, like we usually augment our data in machine learning. Uh, but we do not, know, do not have a clear answer as to what model augmentations are a suitable choice for this task. Uh, this is also an interesting direction to pursue. Uh, this research was aimed at expanding the understanding of backdoors on machine learning models for computer vision and developing defense and detection methods. I believe the lessons learned will be greatly beneficial in future work. Uh, optimizing for only accuracy is not enough when we are developing machine learning systems for high stakes domains. We need to make sure that our models are fair, have not been tampered with, preserve privacy of sensitive data, and its decision making can be understood. Building trustworthy systems will ease user skepticism and help in the widespread adoption of machine learning systems. In my dissertation, the focus has been studying model robustness. A lot of siloed research has been done in each of these areas, robustness, fairness, privacy, and explainability. But quite often in safety critical applications, we need to maintain high standards of more than one of these properties. I believe a holistic study of trustworthiness is needed and making machine learning worthy of our trust is our biggest challenge in the next few years. I would once again like to acknowledge all my collaborators who have supported me in my research, Akshay, Ajinkya, Surush, Sohail, Haiko, and Hamid, and my other lab mates who have played an integral part in my doctoral studies. Uh, thank you, that's all from me. Uh, I'll be happy to take any more questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. So Anupam, Anupam, should I do or do you want to do it? Um, no, no, I think you should do it, Hamid. I mean, oh, sure. I'm, yeah. I'm, here, I'm here to sign the piece of, well, I'm here in my committee member role and, and the sort of the chair role is just to sign the piece of paper in your absence, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Anruda, and thanks for the questions so far. So should we go around and ask more questions? Who wants to start first? 
from the committee member? Uh, well, I I can go if that's all right. Yeah, yeah so I've uh, first great talk, uh, lots of good work. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, very coherent, as I said, like the one idea was clever. Lots of clever ideas in here, so uh, so good stuff. Um, just I wrote a couple of things down in the Emacs buffer while you were talking, and so one is like er early on you were talking about attack success rates, um, and your attack success rates on the first part I think that you were talking about were between the 30s and the 50s and the 60s. Is is there any notion of what a good attack success rate is? And you know how do your attack success rates compare to others? I'm, I'm just looking for some. Like in the literature, is there some sense that, you know, you need to be above 50% for it to be considered an effective attack? Uh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, maybe I can go back. Uh, I guess these ones, right? Uh, uh maybe the. The previous, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you got ASRs of 70, 36, and 31. Yeah, so uh, one, one, I guess, point is that it really depends on the type of attack. So we, like, uh, when we are comparing, let's say, two different methods, like the type of attack being done matters. For example, this is like a binary classification task, and here it's like, uh, a multi, like for example, this row, it's like a, a multi source single target attack. So we want like multiple uh, category images to be uh, classified as the target. So uh, I guess that matters as well. So, um, and to answer your question as to what is a good number, um, yeah, I don't. I, I don't really know if there is like a consensus on what should be a good number for a successful backdoor attack. Okay, I mean, just the, re yeah. the reason I'm asking is those numbers are kind of ungrounded, right? And, you know, if you, it's sort of like you tell me your classification accuracy mm -hmm. is eighty percent, and I go, okay, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. doesn't tell me a whole lot. I mean, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I believe like there is, uh, like as I mentioned, like when you are comparing different attacks, uh, it's important that you compare your attack success rate with another attack, which is somewhat of a similar type. If you yep. uh, compare across attacks, it doesn't really make sense. So I, I, I know like there has been follow-up work on, on, on this paper, which mm -hmm. has some, uh, like does some benchmarking and compares different attacks of a similar type, but uh, I don't really recall the numbers, so yeah. But okay. I, I'm like, I'm happy to like follow up with you. If you I mean, that's fine. Just having a baseline to compare yeah. to would, would be interesting. Um, so just, and, so just yeah. a note here, we can at least compare with a random chance, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that I mean, that's a, a weak baseline, but yeah, I mean, you're definitely doing way better than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then the, the next thing is, uh, and I'm not even sure if you've got an opinion on this, but um, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the universal litmus patterns. I completely understand the training mechanism, uh -huh. um, but what are the ULPs doing to the network? So, I, you know, if you just had to give sort of a qualitative explanation of what's going yeah. on inside the network, like, can uh -huh. you give me some intuition for that? Yeah, so uh, I guess, um... There have been like there has been prior work which has shown that like they have employed a different technique to detect backdoors. So what they have uh, shown is that uh, let's say you have a backdoor model and you manage to you manage to have access to a set of clean images and a set of backdoor images like mm -hmm. which which will be used to backdoor. And when they pass it through the model, uh, there are certain like the, the, if, you, if you compare the activations of the clean and backdoor model, there yep. are certain neurons which are activated really like they're, they're outlier activations. Yeah. Like the backdoor images uh, cause that, and then they use that to uh, like to to detect 
like yep. which parts of the network or something. So I guess the intuition here is exactly the same, but we are training these sets of images, like instead of having, like we can't assume we have access to clean and backdoor data to do that sort of analysis, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't really know what the trigger is. So how, how do we maybe like circumvent that? So we are trying to come up with these sets of images which will uh, like which are we can say these are sort of an aggregation of all types of backdoor images. So when these are passed through a backdoor model, they are probably uh, they cause some outlier activation, and that helps the binary classifier to separate the clean and poison models. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's good. So so in essence, these are sort of approximations to um, triggered images. Yeah, kind of tickling the right parts of the network to activate the part that is responsible for the misclassification. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, exactly. and and sorry, and then the the output you're looking at the logits. I can't remember here. So what what is it that you're pooling? Uh, so yeah, so essentially, like like in terms of implementation, this is like uh like we we have a batch of images, right? We yeah. pass it through the network. And then uh, the outputs are pooled, like the outputs of the network are pooled. Like the outputs, of the, right, at the output layer, sort of what, yeah. what's the probabilities over the classes, essentially? No, no, no. So uh, what we pool here is like the out, like after the ULPs are passed through a model, uh, we pool like not the probabilities, but like the earlier embeddings, like some, some oh, intermediate okay. feature layer. Yeah. So you are using an intermediate feature representation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that um, that that pool feature representation is uh, passed to the binary classifier. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I understand. Okay. That's what I've got for now. I'll I'll okay. yield. Don't understand this. I um, <clears throat> I thought I understood this, but as you were answering it, it occurred to me maybe I did it. Um. Wait, so what is the class? How do you train this thing? Because the models you train, you already have a certain number of models. Okay. Uh -huh. Like hundreds of clean models, hundreds of poison models, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have a classifier that acts on all of them simultaneously. So you can take the outputs of all of these models and you can concatenate them together for this classifier? Uh, no. So I guess how we do that exactly is that we can, like, like we can have like a mini batch of models, right? We can load a small batch of models and then like then optimize uh, for the classifier and the ULPs and then move on to another batch of models, like similar to what we do for images, let's say. But don't you treat each model like an independent sample? Like you want to analyze each model to see whether it's poisoned or not? Why are you pooling all of the outputs for these models together? So, yeah, I, I guess, like, the way we do it is, yeah, I mean, I think the way we implement it is we load each model individually, and then, uh, yeah, then when the updates are done, that is done on, like, a batch of models we process. So, yeah, I guess you're asking is, I, I guess what you're asking is during training, we, uh, when we update the ULPs, we use a batch of models, but at test time, we are using a single model. Correct? Why is that? Well, I don't understand what the pooling layer is doing here in this figure you have. What's the pooling layer doing? Oh, okay. So I guess, yeah, maybe. So, uh, so let, let me uh, like let me explain what like one step of what happens in optimization. So we have a set of models. We pick one model from the set, and these are like shared weights. Like that means this is exactly the same model. So we can represent it like this: like the ULPs are going through the same model, and then the what, some intermediate feature layer uh, output is pulled. Or we can show, we can you can also okay. think of it as like this is a batch of images which is going through one model, like right. this. Yeah. So does that like does that? Ah, I get it. That makes sense. Okay. 
maybe I, I don't know maybe the illustration uh, is is a bit confusing but yeah uh, but yeah there are yeah you can look at it in that way it it's like ju it's like just a simple batch of images being passed through a model and then uh, we do some sort of pooling at the end so yeah uh, any another other? another way of saying that just to clarify is that pooling is across ulps and not different models the whole pooling okay. is using single model but different ulps yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Could, could you remind me, so doing so with this UAP, do you get better uh, detection performance compared to like conventional detection method where they don't have access to those uh, um, trend backdoor model? Mm, yeah, so one of our baselines we compared to was neural yeah. cleanse. Right. Yeah. So, and we see that uh, one, one uh, important point is we couldn't actually uh, run neural cleanse for let's say GTSRP or tiny image net because it does like uh, all sorts of source pair combinations. It has to compute and then calculate this outlier. So it's very computationally expensive, but at least for the ones uh, we could uh, run it we see that the ULP's uh, performance is better, like at least for CFAR 10 and GTSRB. For so MNIST, okay. there is not much difference, but yeah. Thank you. Now, one of my students has a paper that's very, well, really inspired by this, by the way, we're doing membership inference attacks um, using different test mm -hmm. images, very similar to ULP. And in retrospect, I actually think the way that you're doing the classifiers is probably better than what we've been trying. And so we should probably do something more like the pooling that you're doing. Okay. So what exactly uh, are you trying to do? Like, Oh, well, we're just trying to do, um, I just want to know whether a model was trained on a sample. Okay. Okay. Was a sample part of the training set? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of pipeline to do that. Um, this is a comment. It's not really a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my questions just about transferability in all of these things, right? Um, with these different kinds of, um, you know, how transferable are these poisons? There's always factors that we kind of hold constant, right? So like in SSL, um, would your poison images transfer across data sets if you didn't know exactly what data set was being collected? Mm -hmm. um, would, would your would your attacks transfer across data sets? In other words, let's say you create some poisons for like Lion, mm -hmm. uh, you end up sticking those in, and it turns out the data set they're using is more similar to like ImageNet. Mm -hmm. Would you expect to get some sort of transfer between those two? So yeah. Yeah, that's a good Our point. by the way, is another thing, right? Like a lot of these SSL backbones, there are very few different architecture variations that we'll test on, right? Um, how how well do these kinds of like SSL attacks, for example, transfer across data sets, backbones, I don't know, different kind of training protocols? So uh, about backbones, I guess we have... Uh, yeah, so we, we did experiments with different backbones, like MoCo, BYO, and MSF. Yeah. Uh, and we well, see... I said backbones, they meant like architecture, architectures, right? Like these, oh, okay. I guess it's probably different, they're, they're backbones too, okay. but these okay. are more okay, you the mean... law as used, right? Yeah, I mean, the methods are different, but even in one method, you can vary the backbone. Like you can have ResNet or you can have VIT or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe this varies the backbone, but yeah, yeah, I, I don't, like we don't really have numbers to uh, show what happens when we vary the backbone. But as to your other point about like, we don't really know like what data sets a downstream task might be trained on. So how do we ensure that this attack works? So. Like here, like we we have this thing that like this labeled data set we are using is just like a reduced version of the unlabeled data set. 
so these are coming from like these kind of have the same classes so in that case it it's it's was like it we can have this sort of targeted thing happening where but if this these the classes here are totally different then i believe it's hard to actually uh expect that like such sort of targeted attack would work maybe it like this sort of poisoning will mess up the features of the model in some way so that there are some sort of misclassifications but uh yeah but i guess yeah uh, yeah i guess we don't really know yeah Um, don't know any other questions at the top of my head right now. I think I'll pass to somebody else. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else wants to have questions? Me, you, and a farm. Um, no, not really a question. I'll just go back to my comment, right? It'd be good to circumscribe, especially in the light of the questions you're getting, what the universal patch sort of does and does not do um, because uh, not only in the in the space of the possible triggers but in the space of the possible ways that you could create poison models i mean you you're not completely exploring that space and you can't because you don't know what people may be able to do so just being a a little more circumscribed would be helpful. Otherwise, you know, as everyone has said, there's some really clever ideas here and they're all published in great places, so. So can, can I just ask a follow-up based on the previous discussion? Please. Um, you know, thinking about the self-supervised learning is it the case then that there are just tons of natural triggers and all these self-supervised models? So for example, um, you know, imagine I've got, uh, I, I don't know, pictures of cats, for example, right? And um, the cats, I don't know, 5% of the cats are wearing collars, right? Then it, it starts to look a little bit like, oh, there's this weird thing that's associated with 5% of the cats. Um, and now if I put a collar on a horse or a dog or whatever, it might get misclassified as a cat, but I guess the trick is, so, so, you know, have people explored the extent to which natural triggers like that might exist, or is that a nonsensical idea? I just want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I believe like in, in supervised settings, like again, like going back to the discussion of what can my trigger be? So I believe there have been works like papers, which like title like <laughs> natural backdoors triggers yep. or something, yep. which have studied that for a supervised setting. And uh, yeah, my, I guess if I, I, yeah, if I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I guess exactly. Right. So the question is, have people looked at that in the self yeah. setting? Uh, yeah. For, yeah. So for supervised setting, if I recall, I think there is a paper which like, as you mentioned, like colors of cats, they had something like uh, striped cars. Like if you have, if you have cars and then you have like certain stripes in your cars, in your data set, then that acts like some sort of artifact in your training data set, which might act as a natural trigger. I believe there have been, there has been work. And with SSL, I think there has not like, not been much work with SSL and backdoors. Uh, like, like essentially thinking of those things as backdoors for SSL, but there have been works on identifying like shortcuts. Like if you have like essentially these SSL methods, like, uh, like for example, like if we talk about previous, like older methods, like Jigsaw or Rotnet. So those were like pretext tasks. Like we, like it's like a human, uh, like kind of, we are designing that task. It's like a human, uh, prior we are inserting that, okay, if my model learns to solve jigsaw puzzles, or if my model learns to understand the orientation of images, that might result in learning like good visual features for downstream tasks. 
Right. So uh, I believe there has been work in studying that can like, is it possible to have certain certain sorts of features in your images, which might uh, which might create a shortcut. Like the the model might latch on to that to solve the task, but it it won't learn any good visual features. Yeah. So I guess maybe that maybe you can call that to be like a shortcut or a backdoor. Yeah. But yeah. I I think there has been work in that direction. So we don't really like people have worked on maybe mitigating that or developing methods which don't really rely on shortcuts so that the features we learn are actually transferable to other tasks. That's that's exactly what we want. We don't have any labels. We have a large set of unlabeled data. Now how do we how do we like learn the knowledge from this unlabeled data? And we don't want our models to be learning from something undesirable. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm all, I'm all set. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other committee member wants to ask questions? So, should we go to the closed session or? I think so. Okay. A any other question from the other audience other than committee members? Before going to the closed session. Okay, I think there is no question. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks everybody. So probably we can have everybody please leave the room so that only the committee members can stay. And then uh, I'm gonna let you know Aniruda on Skype to come back. Okay. Okay. And can you also turn off the? I guess I'm not sure if you're recording still. Oh yeah, I can turn it off. Yeah, I appreciate uh, it. Let me see.